speak at the meeting today. Um, I'm Kate Newbold. I'm one of the clinical oncologists at the Royal Marsden who manages thyroid cancer. Um, I'm going to talk today about advances in the management of anaplastic thyroid cancer and specifically focusing on the advances in targeted I'll try to outline a little bit of the, the background, um, the current understanding and advances and the paradigm shift in how we manage this uh, disease, um, and then give an illustration um, towards the end of this, uh, the talk. So we know that anaplastic thyroid cancer is an extremely aggressive tumor with a very poor prognosis. It's probably the most aggressive um, solid uh, cancer that we have in, in humans with a median survival of uh, between three and five months and a one year survival of only up to 20%. Patients rarely survive more than two years after their diagnosis. So it's a devastating diagnosis. It's extremely hard for uh, patients and their families to accept um, there's a fear uh, of, a, of suffocating, a fear of a distressing death, and um, equally it is met with a nihilistic but sadly often realistic message from uh, clinicians managing this disease as well. So patients most commonly present with stage 4B or stage 4C, um, so either locally um, advanced within the neck or metastatic at uh, presentation. It's usually inoperable. Um, palliative radiotherapy can be used to temporarily delay uh, the growth of, of the tumour. Um, and this can be, can be effective and can buy some time and uh, improve some of the symptoms, particularly pain as well if there's a big inflammatory um, response um, of the tumour. Cytotoxic chemotherapy sadly is disappointing um, with response rates less than uh, 20%. Um, and even if the patients do respond to chemotherapy, it doesn't tend to have a very long lasting effect. So generally patients are given this terrible diagnosis uh, and then managed with best supportive care. So involvement of palliative care um, support right from um, the outset is, is key to managing a difficult situation. So sadly, this is still really the most appropriate approach in, in many cases. And there's been a real desperate need uh, for progress in the management of this uh, particular disease. And we have begun to understand more about the biology of anaplastic thyroid cancer. It's the, the genomic um, landscape particularly has been characterized and is now much better understood. So we understand now that most cases are driven either by a mutation in BRAF or RAS, which are mutually exclusive. And so you can then start to divide um, uh, groups of patients out according to phenotype based um, on uh, those genomic uh, alterations. So we divide them into RAS mutated, the BRAF B600E mutated, and those that are BRAF and RAS wild type. Interestingly, the RAS driven tumors tend to be more aggressive with the worst prognosis, and, and the BRAF uh, V600E mutated ones are now have a better prognosis, but because we have BRAF directed therapy. The BRAF and the RAS wild type uh, tumours have an intermediate uh, prognosis. Other alterations that we see in anaplastic thyroid cancer, um, almost three quarters of the patients will have a TP53 uh, mutation. We see the TERT promoter mutation in, again, a, around 70% of anaplastic thyroid cancers. And you'll be aware of the TERT, mutator, um, the TERT uh, promoter mutation in association with BRAF in differentiated thyroid cancer, leading to a more aggressive um, uh, natural history of disease. And it may be that the TERT uh, promoter mutation in anaplastic sort of signifies a uh, disease that's arisen on the background of previous differentiated thyroid cancer. We also see this um, EIF1AX uh, mutations in association with the RAS mutations, mutations in the PI3 kinase uh, pathway, and then rarely, um, but important to look for, fusions in ALK, RET, and NTRAC. And those are important to look for because those also have drugs directed against those alterations in the pathways that are inappropriately activated when those alterations are present. 
looking at the um, uh, sort of immunophenotype of, of these tumors, uh, 20 to 30 uh, percent express PDL1. They're infiltrated with tumor associated macrophages. But interestingly, the tumor mutational burden, which we see is high in aggressive other other aggressive solid tumors, it's although it's higher than differentiated thyroid cancer, it's, it's still not that high. And I find that quite surprising when we understand the, the nature of um, the behavior of anaplastic thyroid cancer. So the American uh, Thyroid Association up dated the, uh, their guidelines for the management of anaplastic thyroid cancer um, in 2021. Um, this was a second edition of these guidelines. The previous ones had been published in 2012. So there was a, a significant clinical and science, scientific um, uh, change in the approach and understanding. Uh, so there was clearly a, re a requirement for update of the guidelines. So I've put the next two slides up because I think these flow diagrams are probably the most useful um, parts of the uh, ATA guidelines. Uh, there are two figures. Um, the, the first one is looking at stage 4A and 4B disease. And I can't show you with my cursor, but uh, there you will see throughout the pathway that the, actually the genetic uh, alterations seen within the tumor, if present, um, are important parts of this pathway. Uh, so it is important to get the molecular profiling done as soon as you can on any tissue that is, is taken as part of a biopsy up front. And that's why we would tend to recommend doing a core biopsy now so that we have enough tissue for molecular uh, processing. And this is the second diagram, uh, this time looking at uh, the management for stage 4C disease, so those patients who present with metastatic or M1 uh, disease. And you'll see again that the uh, genomic status of the patient's tumour is important within these pathways, specifically looking for BRAF mutation, uh, other alterations such as ALK, NTRAC and RET fusions. It also has a path here for checkpoint inhibitors such as pembrolizumab and looking therefore at uh, PDL1 expression and uh, tumor mutational burden. Now we can't access uh, immunotherapies for anaplastic thyroid cancer at the moment uh, in the UK, but it is likely that this will become part of treatment in the future as more data come through and we're able to use that data uh, to see if we can justify um, switching to that approach and for funding as well. So what is the data? Um, so the most exciting data um, over the last few years has really been the data coming out of MD Anderson um, regarding the combination of dubrafenib, a BRAF inhibitor, with trametinib, a MEK inhibitor, in patients with the BRAF B600E mutant anaplastic thyroid cancer. And this was um, uh, data from the uh, phase two raw uh, study, which included all patients, um, patients with different types of uh, tumor, uh, but with a BRAF mutation. And, and this is uh, particularly looking at the data for the anaplastic thyroid cancers. So they had 36 patients, a median follow-up of 11.1 um, months at the time of um, publication uh, of this in 2022. And they had overall response rates of 56% including three complete responses. 12 month um, duration of response was 50% um, and median progression free survival 6.7 months and overall survival 14.5 months. And if you looked at the 12 month um, progression free survival, this was 43% and the 12 month overall survival was 51.7%. Um, and there were even patients, you know, significant percentage of patients um, uh, alive at 24 months um, for, with a rate of 31.5%. So, you know, these were quite staggering results in a tumour that previously, without treatment, we were seeing, you know, survival durations of really only a, a few months, three to five months, five months at best, really. And there were no significant um, problems with toxicities or safety of this drug combination in these patients. So this was a real change in um, uh, uh, how we might be able to um, treat um, patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer with this particular 
I think these two figures uh, from the raw study publication are useful. So the top figure is a, a waterfall plot and anything below the x-axis is a response or a reduction in volume of disease. Uh, the dotted line is the 30% uh, reduction, uh, which therefore defines the partial responses according to resist. And you can see here that there are even some complete responses, uh, the four cases at the end uh, there, uh, which uh, is, is really um, uh, quite amazing when we first saw the, these, this data coming out. The second graph underneath is the swimmer's plot. Again, important because this is showing that there's a duration or a durable response in these patients. So the x-axis is in weeks below uh, and the scale is zero up to uh, 280 there. So, you know, really some really good durable responses to this uh, drug combination. And it was a well-tolerated uh, combination. Um, we're used to using this combination in other tumor sites, for example, uh, melanoma uh, with this um, BRAF mutation. So it wasn't, um, there weren't unexpected um, uh, adverse events in patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer. There were requirements for dose reduction and most commonly um, we will see pyrexia, um, and then the, the sort of generalized um, side effects that we see with other kinase inhibitors, such as decreased appetite, fatigue, nausea, particularly with trametinib, um, is another um, side effect that I've had to reduce um, the doses in, in my patients. It tends to be nausea and pyrexia that we see, sometimes anemia as well. Um, but, but nothing that was unmanageable um, with, with a, a dose reduction and then often patients would then be um, reasonably well on that um, dose reduced um, regimen. And only six of those 36 patients had to permanently discontinue uh, due to adverse events. We also looked and published um, the data from the initial cohort of patients that we treated in the UK with dibrafenib and trametinib. Um, so we were able to access this through a compassionate access um, program with uh, Novartis before it uh, became approved. Um, we had 17 patients uh, and we didn't meet the uh, same um, results that we'd seen in the raw study. So we had a, a shorter overall survival, a median overall survival of 6.9 months and a median progression-free survival of 4.7 months. I think part of the reason why we had reduced um, lengths of survival compared to the raw study was that we really had still had quite a lot of difficulty in getting started on this drug combination. So um, we weren't able to get uh, the combination in all centers um, as soon as we would like to following the diagnosis and following the identification of the BRAF mutation. So I would hope that those results would have improved now, now that we have protocols set up within our pharmacies and now that we have um, more rapid access to that drug combination. Nevertheless, it was a significant improvement on um, where we had been before, uh, where we didn't have that drug combination for this particular um, subpopulation of patients with anaplastic. Um, again, the MD Anderson group, who really are um, pushing forward with the management of anaplastic thyroid cancer, um, with um, Maria Cabanillas, uh, Mark Zaferio. Um, they tend to add in um, salvage pembrolizumab in their patients who start to progress on the combination kinase inhibitors. So they'll have patients on dibrafenib and trametinib initially, and as the disease starts to progress, they will add in pembrolizumab and immunotherapy, um, and they are seeing responses after um, that addition. Um, we're waiting for um, further data to be published so that we can really start to uh, see whether this is a combination or a, um, a, an appropriate um, protocol and approach uh, to look for funding um, for this addition um, within the UK. But at the moment, this remains really within um, the trial setting. MD Anderson again, um, looking at their real world impact of BRAF directed therapy. So they looked at uh, 479 patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer that have been treated between 2000 and 2019. And those um, who had been treated in the era of uh, BRAF directed therapy from 2017 to 2019 uh, made up 152 of that uh, number. And overall survival at one year 
increased from 35% to 59%, and from at the two years from 18% to 42%. So again, real world data suggesting a, a significant move forwards here. We do, however, have to remember that uh, more uh, patients with anaplastic than not don't have a BRAF uh, mutation. Uh, and therefore, we still have a, a large cohort of patients where we have uh, very limited treatment options. Christine Dierks from Germany published the early data from the ATLEP uh, trial, which um, treated patients uh, wild type BRAF uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer with a combination of lenvatinib kinase inhibitor and pembrolizumab, a checkpoint inhibitor or immunotherapy agent. And this has shown really some quite promising um, responses. Uh, she had a partial response in 11 out of 16 um, patients and stable disease in 5 out of 16. Progression-free survival, 8.3 months and overall survival of 10 months. So again, in this particular subgroup of patients, this is really promising data. The difficulty with this drug combination is there is a risk of hemorrhage um, and fistula um, uh, development. So we know that lenvatinib with its anti-VEGF activity uh, can increase the risk of bleeding uh, and fistulation. Uh, and in our patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer, uh, where often there's invasion of the trachea, the esophagus, and encirclement of the uh, big vessels, then this has to be very carefully considered uh, with this uh, combination of drugs. I wanted to show this um, case study just to give you an indication of the type of responses that we see with this targeted therapy. So this 64-year-old lady presented with a rapidly enlarging uh, neck mass, um, which you can see uh, on the clinical picture, but also on the images uh, there. Uh, she uh, did have a BRAF V600E mutation within the tumour. At the time of uh, that diagnosis, we didn't have access uh, to the systemic therapy. She was also getting quite a bit of pain, so we proceeded to palliative The images show how the disease had at that point ulcerated through the skin. We did manage to get um, access to dibrafenib and trametinib, and she started on this treatment and really rapidly we saw a um, uh, reduction of the tumour. Uh, reduction of the ulcerated lesion and then complete healing of the skin. And this was in over a, a matter of weeks. Uh, it was really um, uh, amazing to see how a really specifically targeted uh, therapy uh, can provide rapid uh, and uh, an extremely efficient uh, results. So you can see on these images, the tumor shrank back, uh, the ulceration healed up, uh, and she has been extremely well now five years post-diagnosis. We did go to definitive surgery after she'd had that dramatic um, shrinkage of disease and the pathology showed no residual anaplastic thyroid cancer. She did have some um, differentiated thyroid cancer in the specimen and subsequently, once we realized that she was stable, uh, she has proceeded to radioactive iodine as well. Uh, so this is uh, just to try to illustrate um, the responses that we can see. So to conclude, I think we can be encouraged by the progress that has been made in the management of uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer and in the understanding of the behaviour and the biology of, of this uh, particular thyroid cancer. It does, however, remain a devastating diagnosis in the majority of our patients, uh, and we do therefore need to um, really involve palliative care and a multidisciplinary approach right from the, um, the initial diagnosis. For those patients that we can identify a BRAF B600E mutation, uh, which is up to 45% of cases, then we must uh, uh, think of um, targeted therapy with dibrafenib and trametinib as soon as we can start it. In the future, we will be moving towards neoadjuvant treatment in those patients with a BRAF mutation and other targetable uh, alterations such as NTRAC, uh, fusions, ALK fusions and uh, RET fusions. Um, immunotherapy is likely to be part of the treatment, I'm sure, in combination probably uh, with other kinase inhibitors uh, rather than as a, a, a sole um, agent approach. The key, however, to improve key, uh, outcomes in the meantime and moving and forward is speed. speed. We need speed, speed of diagnosis, we need to have fast track, to have fast fast track, track patients, fast we, need we need to send off um, molecular, send off, um, molecular, molecular tissue as soon as we possibly can, we need to 
expert, uh, expert um, the uh, identification, um, the reputation, the reputation uh, so that we can in uh, so initiate treatment as quickly as possible as well. And this has always been the case and it still is a battle uh, within our overloaded systems, but it is something if we can try to prioritize uh, a specific expedited pathway for our anaphasic para cancer patients, that will make a big difference. Thank you very much. Brilliant. That's really a wonderful talk, I think. It's, uh, I learned a lot from this talk. I think Kate is uh, online now, actually. Um, if you have any questions, um, Kate can, um, she was here. I just muted, but she disappeared. Now. I, I do, Jay. Um, if Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, Kate is back on the call. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, Sorry about that. That's fine. No, it's fine. Thank you, Kate. Um, there are a few questions. Um, questions. I have some questions as well. Um, it's very impressive that um, three uh, two year survival rate goes up to thirty percent in certain patients. Uh, I must say, uh, none of my patients from NHS Tayside lasted more than forty days, forty five days, the maximum. Uh, maybe do we uh, should should go for straight away this um targeted therapy rather than trying for surgery and um uh, and and the second question is part of the same question should we just straight away go for core biopsy uh, than the fnac um just for uh, practical purposes thank you yeah it's, i'd certainly um advise that we go for core biopsy straight away because the key here is uh, you know with everything thing uh, with anaplastic is speed. So you want to get that tissue off uh, to pathology um, uh, and then the um, uh, the molecular analysis to happen as quickly as possible, plus or minus immunohistochemistry for BRAF if the labs will do that, which gives you a faster initial response. Because as you see, with if you do have um, an alteration in BRAF, if you do have that mutation, then you can get really dramatic responses pretty quickly. So in, in answer to your first uh, part of the question, surgery is still the only curative option for anaplastic. So if you do think that you've got a tumor that you can resect completely, um, uh, then then go for surgery. Um, obviously, we, we want it um, um, resected if that's the case. But if there's debate as to whether you can actually resect it cleanly uh, with uh, with an R0 resection, then um, and the patient has BRAF mutation, then dibrafenib and trametinib, I think, is is really now um, you know the, the way to go in the first instance. And then. What's quite difficult then is to judge when to go for surgery. Um, it is quite difficult and it depends on the individual patient and how they respond. I mean, most of the ones that I've had, they do respond dramatically like that, uh, like the, the case that I showed. Uh, but there are some that don't respond quite so much, but maybe have stable disease. And, and, and so it does um, vary slightly uh, with the individual as to when you would then um, re, we would re-engage you uh, on the surgical side. Brilliant, thank you. I think um, Ricard has got uh, some question as well. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jay. Thank, thanks, UK, for you know wonderful tour de force of anaplastic thyroid cancer. And I think the um, I, I, just a comment and a, and a, and a question uh, really. I mean, I think obviously everything we we, we discussed a similar or you know part of that sort of kind of setting in 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 the uh, in the panel. Um, and I think one of the frustrations that I had, and I, we had that those, those private conversations with you, is about those individual poor patients, especially, you, you know, potentially kind of young patients. And oh, I think it, it, and then you try to kind of then to treat them and there is no drugs out there. And I think uh, it, I think we just need, uh, my comment is that I think we just need a national kind of protocol on this because although they are rare, they need to be, everybody needs to be aware that there are drugs out there. And then, and then we need to convince NICE or whoever, you know, proves those drugs that this is uh, there is enough evidence to treat these patients appropriately in, in, in appropriate centers. 
but uh, and then the question to you is that you know how far we are from 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 this i mean we we trying to kind of have a kind of a speed protocol now we can have access to uh, uh BRAP mutation and certainly in the last year we we, we managed to do that and we have 72 hours turnaround which is really good but then yes fine we we get it and then we, we, there's nowhere to get the, those drugs and and it, it, it it's um it, or you have to kind of to go through through uh you know through a very extensive um kind of uh, request and all the rest of it it's just to have that um um you know uh, really access well that, you... that has changed ricard so um the brafnib and trametinib is available Available on the CDF on the Cancer Drugs Fund. So all you, all you, your oncologist needs to do now is fill in uh, what's called a B star form, which is very simple and that is quick. So you know I'll fill it in when I've seen the patient, and that means I can get the drug started the next day. And most um, the drug combination, sorry, and most uh, of us now will have the protocol set up with our pharmacies. So that real world data from the UK was when we hadn't really set up the protocol so um, that all had to go through pharmacy and local drugs and therapeutics committees and so there was you know weeks of delay to get that started and that really impacts on those outcome data now um, as soon as you get a whiff of um, an anaplastic <laughs> you send the tissue off for um, uh, for NGS and it's brilliant you've got a 72 turnaround we've got about a well if, if we really push it but the thing is is as you say you need the pathway because even though I've set out a pathway, I still have to ring everyone up. I still have to drive it myself. Um, and we can get BRAF turned around in 48 hours. And we're now doing the immuno as well. So we can get, and you're allowed to start on based on the immuno result, um, which is then confirmed on the NGS afterwards. So it is moving forward. But as you say, you know, a national awareness is what we're trying to push because even now you know i'll get referred anaplastics which have been kind of swilling around in the system for for four weeks and you think you know and, and it and it had been questioned as to being anaplastic it's not that it hadn't been thought about and you just think you know that is just not good enough now of course that is really we're all under massive pressure and it's you know it is difficult but they are rare patients it's not you're not ringing up your mdt coordinator your pathologist and your radiologist every week asking them to do this so i think it is totally fair that you can ring them and say look i know the deadline for the mdt is passed but but please can we look at this because i want to start this treatment within a week and that does make such a difference you know the real there is a variation in the in the in the behavior of the anaplastics, but those real anaplastics that we know um, just rapidly take off within days. And so you've really got to start. And with the targeted therapy, the nature of the targeted therapy is that you see results pretty quickly. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's that really that's great news because that's actually changed very recently. So. Yeah. In, in Scotland, and Nick um, might be able to um, correct me, but I, I thought that in Scotland it is being reviewed again this week, actually. Um, oh, no, it's but already. I may be the, the good supreme. news is that in the last four to six weeks, um, we, we are now actually getting molecular testing as a standard. But it's, it's got to be, the pathologists have got to remember to do it. But I was actually going to make a comment yes. that from a practical point of view, to, I, I like your, to use your analogy, when you get a whiff of an anaplastic, you need to speak yeah. to your pathologists before it goes, before the sample is taken, so that the, the lab know that they've got to do this. What you don't want is you do the you do a core biopsy, and then two days later it's still sitting in the lab, and you know, a pathologist who doesn't do thyroid pathology is sitting there, hasn't done anything. So you need to make sure that they know there's a specimen coming, so that they can then fast track it, and that's that's because we've just had this discussion in the West about how we do this. And I think it's actually starting to work. And as we've now got, we now we've got an agreement for BRAF mutations to be done. They're done twice a week. Uh, there's a Monday run and a Thursday run. So they, they promise that within four days. So actually the turnaround time is fast, but it, it needs liaison yeah. and, and getting that whiff and acting on yeah. that whiff. Brilliant, brilliant. There's, That's fantastic news you. for Scotland. There's one more question um, from the online. Do patients with non-M1 ATC who have complete regression and negative surgical pathology after targeted therapy need lifelong TKI? Uh, when do they stop? Uh, that's the question. I don't know whether you have answered so it. Yeah. 
No, that's a really good question. And um, we don't have the data yet. So we do tend to put our patients back on um, because we, we, we're nervous about not putting them back on um, because, you know, we're so unused to having, you know, um, cures in that setting. We don't have that data yet. So we tend to put them back on at the moment, as do the, my colleagues in MD Anderson. Um, in fact, the lady I presented had some toxicity with uveitis, which is a, a known um, toxicity, um, and she couldn't go back on it um, uh, after one year after um, her surgery and she's been off completely now for uh, three and a half years and is, is controlled. So I suspect it will be like other uh, tumour sites where they have adjuvant therapy maybe for two years and then stop, um, but we're, we don't have that full data yet. Um, we're waiting for that data to come through. So at the moment we put them back on. Brilliant. As one more question for, from myself. This, uh, the two combination medicines, is it is everyday treatment is it oral yeah okay. so um uh, one of the drugs is given once a day and one of the drugs is given twice a day uh, it's oral um so patients are treated without patients it's similar to other kinase inhibitors in the sense that um we see them quite frequently in the first four to six weeks i either weekly or two weekly in order to nip the side effects in the bud and to get on top of them um, and add in concomitant antihypertensive if necessary or antiemetics and dose reductions etc and then once they're stable i see them once a month so i mean you know quality of life is pretty good with these it's it's not like you know in the setting of where we are it's a it's a pretty well tolerated um drug combination brilliant thank you very much kid uh, that's absolutely wonderful uh, thank you and a lot of information thank you uh, now we have um the last but not least um Okay, so you check in uh, Ricard's uh, link. That's fine. But um, I just change your. Uh, Sorry, I tried to. Um, I tried to kind of help. I don't. I didn't know that we had an individual uh, link. But anyway, it looks like uh, it's not. It's not me. I. I obviously I'm a little more handsome than him. Don't worry. Uh, um, that's it. <laughs> I know. I know. Although, uh, although he's the best. He's, be, he's a better speaker and he's more intelligent than me. That's, uh, that's why he's a professor. Anyway, but it's not me. And I'm just trying to facilitate the, the link. So yeah. that's great. I'm really looking forward to your talk, uh, Razor. Yes, um, just one moment. Um, how, do you, how do you spell his name? Thank you for this. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Good. Uh, we just uh, change it. Yeah, change it.